What's up guys, Jacob here. Today's lesson is sponsored by Science because we're gonna be talking about the audio spectrum. We're gonna go into terms like frequency, hertz, waveform, harmonic series, and we're gonna talk about why these concepts are important to know and how you can apply them when you're mixing your own music. So what is the audio spectrum? It is the audible frequency range at which humans can hear, and it spans from 20 hertz all the way up to 20,000 hertz. I tried to spare you some of the super, super high frequencies just because they can get really hard to listen to. But there are a few reasons why understanding this spectrum is so important. One is that our hearing changes as we get older. Perfect human hearing, yes, it can go from 20 to 20,000 hertz, but as we all get older, we lose a little bit, especially in that top range. The top of our hearing comes down to really be more about six or 7,000 hertz. This is also important to know as a mixer because if you're dealing with a track that you wanna release commercially, you need to know that most systems are made to play from 20 hertz to 20,000, especially knowing that below a certain frequency, it's not so much perceivable with the ear as it is felt. You can feel low bass frequencies. With high frequencies, sometimes they might sound really annoying or really brittle, or you might not really be able to hear them at all, especially when you get into that 16,000 range but you'll notice if you boost or cut them completely from an entire track or even an instrument, you will hear the difference. You can hear when they're there and when they're not. The sound in that sweep we just did through the audible spectrum is a sine wave. The sine wave being the simplest waveform possible. And you can see that note I just played is A440 which if you've learned anything about the Western tonal system and the way that we tune in the Western world, A440 is the standard tuning for that system. This plugin here is a waveform visualizer that actually shows us the waveform we're looking at, but it's giving us both the frequency and the amplitude of the wave. So you can see when the note is softer, the amplitude is lower, meaning the vertical axis. But then you also have the frequency. Frequency is the rate at which a vibration occurs that constitutes a wave. And you measure frequency in hertz, which is the number of cycles per second. So if you look at the waveform visualizer, you'll see that there are a relatively low number of cycles in this low A. But if I go up a few octaves, look at how many more cycles there are per second. And higher still. And down here, we can see one full cycle of a sine wave. The simplest waveform possible is the sine wave. It cannot be produced in nature. It is not a natural sound, but we can make it with synthesizers. All other waves can be built by layering multiple sine waves together. So for instance, if you layered a bunch of sine waves together at the right frequencies, eventually the scope would not show one cycle of a sine wave anymore, but it would show what looks more like a square wave. And as you got it more and more layered, it would start to look more and more square and less like a sine. Isn't that cool? Many waves or sounds have what are known as harmonics, which form the harmonic series, which is a series of overtones which sound along with the fundamental pitch. It's a series of notes that is produced naturally when you sound them. It's nothing artificial, it's not anything I'm doing here to layer sounds that you don't see, it occurs naturally. Most of the tones in the harmonic series are not in tune with our Western tonal system, so we have to compensate when we try to write it out on staff paper to make up for the deviations in pitch. We can observe the harmonic series in other instruments as well, like a piano. guitar, a trumpet, a berry sax,
One crucial thing to realize here is that all these instruments are playing the same harmonic series above that fundamental pitch, yet they all sound completely different from one another. These unique sound qualities have everything to do with how the instrument is constructed and how the sound is produced on the instrument. Like uh, the sound of my cat purring. Oh, he's so cute. But you could see the frequency information for the sound of a cat purring, again, is completely different from a piano or a guitar, and it has everything to do with how the sound is being produced in the throat of the animal, which is different than, say, how a brass instrument is played with a mouthpiece through vibration. But the one thing all sounds have in common is that they are vibrations through the air, which reaches our ears, which is how we perceive that sound. Now that we've finished the nerdy science portion, you're probably wondering why do I need to know this stuff? Whenever you're doing any kind of EQ, you need to understand that you are not only just turning up and down different parts of the frequency spectrum, but you're also changing the harmonics of that instrument. You may be completely taking them out in some cases. I'm gonna do a little demonstration right now with a drum kit. And let's isolate just the snare. Now I'm gonna to refer to my handy dandy music instrument frequency cheat sheet from Sweetwater. So if I wanted to give the snare drum a little bit more girth, a little bit more uh, weight or thickness, I would boost around 100 to 200. And that makes sense because a lot of snare drums, their fundamental pitch is at about 200 hertz. And this brings back to why understanding the science behind frequency and sound is so important, because as we saw with even a simple sine wave or a triangle wave, they all have fundamental pitches and overtones that sound over the top. So for a snare drum, the fundamental pitch or the strongest pitch, the lowest note, is at 200 hertz. And we could continue to boost that as much as we want to, and you'll hear more of the tone of that fundamental frequency, that fundamental pitch. We can go into the range that they're calling bark. And I like to use extremes. Obviously, this isn't always super practical when you're actually mixing, but if you use an extreme boost like this, you can hear what sounds very similar to when we did the sine sweep, and you can hear the pitch that you're boosting. So if we boost that 1K range, you can hear what we're doing there. But when you have it boosted too high, you can hear that resonance and it doesn't really sound very natural at all. But just little light boosts in these areas can change the texture. And in this case, it's giving it a bark or a little bit more of a presence or an attack. And that's our video. I hope you enjoy this basic overview of some of the science of sound. If you'd like to see more content like this, please let me know in the comments. Remember to like, subscribe, click here for more videos like this one, and go to sweetwater.com for all of your music instrument and pro audio needs.